Okay, all set. Go ahead. We have a sense of C1. Thank you. Here, I'll just go ahead and introduce them. Yeah, I'm going to. Just explain the QA Yeah. So, what do you think you're going to say? Have them either raise their hand or post in the chat, and then you'll moderate the question. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. No, you don't want to. I can do it. That's fine. Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, everybody who's here, thanks for coming, and for everybody who uh, signed on to the Zoom, thanks for thanks for coming too. Um, this is Dr. Brian Kudrowski. Brian is uh, the Charles and Elizabeth Schrock Faculty Development Professor, um, and he's also an Associate Professor of Nuclear Engineering and Radiological Sciences at the University of Michigan. Uh, Brian got his PhD in 2009 from University of uh, Wisconsin Madison. Um, shortly thereafter, he took a job at Los Alamos National Laboratory, working on the MCMP development team developing uh, Monte Carlo methods. Um, the research that he's doing at University of Michigan focuses on development of novel and improved methods for calculating how radiation interacts with matter. I think you've selected a subset of that topic to talk about today. Yes. Um, so, you know, Brian's going to talk to us about next generation methods uh, for accelerating transport calculations. Um, for anybody who is online, if you would, um, either raise your hand or post your question to the chat, and um, I'll, I'll moderate all the questions. So take it away, Brian. All right. Thank you, John. All right. Welcome, everyone. So I guess why don't we get started? Maybe. All right. All right. So just wanted to tell you what we're about and kind of a few methods that we've been developing to make transport calculations go faster. And if some of those words don't make sense, that's okay. I'll try to get the crash course explanation. Okay, so the team we have is called UMCT, the University of Michigan Computational Particle Transport Team. And kind of what we did, what John said, we developed advanced radiation transport methods. And we do this for a plethora of applications, whether they be nuclear energy, radiation shielding detection, safeguards and operation. And there's actually a connection to NC State. So it's kind of nice to be here because this kind of spurred a lot of the work that we do in the group. So our transport framework is called Hammer, and I'll talk briefly about that later. And that actually started as a collaboration between user Yasmin and, and John Mattingly and me as part of the, the CNET, the Consortium for Non-Proposition and Enabling Capabilities. And we work a lot with national labs. All right, so here's our team. You know, it's kind of it's students. It's kind of fun to hear what other students are up to. So I don't want to belabor every every student, but just kind of an order of seniority. We have Aaron. He's working on some uncertainty quantification, sensitive analysis for thermal neutron scattering gas. So we do a lot of work with nuclear data as well, as well as as well as like just UQ sensitivity analysis. I know there's some work going on here in the department for that. Evan will talk a little bit about his work at the end of this talk, but he's working with the Oak Ridge and developing some time-dependent neutron transport methods for doing reactor transient simulations. Emily, she's working with San, has worked with Sandia, and she specializes in doing particle transport in what's called stochastic media, where the underlying material properties are unknown, specifically, and are, can only be described statistically. And she's developing novel methods for taking all the theory for electron and photon transport and merging that with the theory for, for stochastic parts, so transport and stochastic media. Kyle, he works on uncertain quantification of fission models. So he's like our resident nuclear physicist. So he's very interested in like, doing quantum mechanics calculations and understanding how nuclear interactions work. Lincoln, he's our newest team member, and we'll talk a little bit about his work. And he uses apply, applying neural networks and machine learning technologies to solve neutron transport problems. And then, of course, we have our great, wonderful overseer. All right, so I want to just take a moment to talk a little bit about PAM, because that's the code we work on. It's a framework. So, in other words, it's a C code base that we as a team develop. And it started again with Professor User, user Yasmin. And it started as a connection with his Thor code. So that's where the name comes from, Thor has a hammer. And what we did is we provided Monte Carlo results to provide to Usury to use for his m collided source to mitigate numerical artifacts in deterministic transport calculations called ray effects. So our main focus is on hybrid deterministic Monte Carlo methods in this project. And our goal is to provide an open source general purpose transport capability 
and it's a little bit behind because of the pandemic, but we hope this calendar year to finally approach the Department of Energy to go through the licensing process to get this uh, distributed. All right. Oh, man, I love this slide. This is what you would get to see if you took my transport class. So a few lectures in, we derived this wonderful, beautiful equation. It is the neutron transport equation. It is really hard to solve. You can't really solve it analytically, at least except for very simple cases. And solving it numerically is pretty tough, and it takes a lot of computing effort to do that. And we'll go into a little bit more about what has to get done to handle this. All right, so part of the transport, why do we care? Well, for our nuclear engineers here, so we seek to understand the behavior of the radiation field. So the behavior of the radiation field tells us things like doses, reaction rates, heating, things that we as engineers care about. That big, that big wonderful equation that I showed in the previous slide, it describes the average or mean behavior of the, of the radiation field. And there are two broad classes of methods we have for solving that equation. The first are deterministic methods, where we take that wonderful calculus problem that we have, we approximately convert it into a linear algebra problem using techniques of numerical discretization, and then we use numerical methods that we would encounter in a math class and solve that at a very high level. And then we have Monte Carlo methods. And what Monte Carlo methods do is they simulate that underlying <coughs> physical radiation behavior. So individual radiation interactions. And from that, we can infer average properties of the radiation field. Okay, so, so again, deterministic methods. I kind of said some of this earlier, but basically, we can take a calculus problem, turn it into a linear algebra problem, and we solve it. That works great, except that we have to introduce discretizations. And there's been a lot of work here at NC State by Professor Asney to understand the errors introduced by those discretizations. But this is an inevitable thing about doing deterministic methods. Deterministic methods are great, though, because they tend to give you a solution very quickly and efficiently relative to Monte Carlo methods. So Monte Carlo methods, again, we don't solve the equation. We simulate the underlying physics and infer the solution from that simulation. The advantage of doing it this way is no discretization is necessary. So we don't have to chunk up the problem into spatial grids or energy groups or anything like that. So the simulation is theoretically as accurate as our understanding of, our, of the physical laws of nature. Problem though, if you've ever had the distinct pleasure of running a Monte Carlo code like MCMP, is you learn that patience is a virtue. Convergence is very slow. It is governed by one of the most awesome theorems in all the mathematics called the central limit theorem, which says that the convergence shows the square root of the number of particles, the number of work you do. So if it takes you an hour to get to 10%, you want to get down to 1%, you're going to have to run 10, 10 times that or 10 squared as long, 100, 100 hours total. So that's annoying. But both advantages, both methods have advantages and disadvantages. So hybrid deterministic Monte Carlo methods, the idea is we leverage the advantages of one method to mitigate the disadvantages of the other. So Monte Carlo methods are commonly used to make deterministic methods more accurate. So a very common example in the reactor world is the generation of multi-group cross-sections. So when you study multi-group transport theory or about diffusion theory in your, in your class, well, one way you can generate accurate cross-sections that are correct for your problem is run a Monte Carlo code and then plug that into a deterministic solver. Also, some of the work we did with Professor Asney on getting collided source terms to mitigate ray effects is another example. Likewise, we can use deterministic methods to provide information which allow us to accelerate Monte Carlo transport applications. And that's what I'm gonna focus mostly on today. So there's two topics. One is it's called variance reduction methods. And the other is the work we've been doing to accelerate reactor transient calculations. Okay, so let's jump into Variance reduction. So as I said, Monte Carlo can be very slow. So in Monte Carlo, again, we normally would like to simulate nature's laws as we believe they happen in, in the physical universe. We don't have to do that, however. And I'll give a few examples. We can simulate a different process 
that on average gives the same behavior. So what we do is we give our simulated particles a statistical weight. And if we're very clever in how we adjust that weight, and we do it in a mathematically correct way, the underlying expectation or mean will come out to be the same as we would get as if you simulated the actual physical process, okay? So there are numerous methods available for doing this. And I'll go into the, the, the couple simple ones just to make this a little more concrete. But one of the challenges and things that I'm gonna hit on is that applying these techniques, deciding which ones to use, and given you select the right techniques, which parameters and how do you pick those, can be a very time consuming from a human point of view process. So we will seek to automate that. All right, so let's talk about the two fundamental techniques that are encountered in parents, just to give you an idea of what we can do. So let's suppose you have two regions of a problem. This red region is less important, this green region is more important. This particle moves from less important region to more important region. You want to encourage particles to go to more important parts of the problem. Okay, so what we can do from across the surface, we can make three identical copies of that particle with a reduced statistical weight. So in this case, the weight of these particles, statistical weight, is one third that of the original. And if we apply that weight to all of our estimates of the radiation field, we get the, we get the same expected value. Well, what if you want to go the other way? Particles go from less important regions to more important regions. What's the opposite of spray? Well, it's, it's called roulette. So what we do, is when a particle with lower weight or a particle from a less important region goes to a more important region goes to a less important region, sorry, we do is we flip a coin or roll a die, whatever way you get a random number. And this and the way this is depicted, one third of the time the particle will survive, two thirds of the time it goes poof, bye bye. And if it survives, we promote the weight back up by a factor of three. So doing it this way preserves the average behavior of the radiation field. This is not what happens in physics, by the way. This is completely numerical mathematics. We still get the right answer in the end, as long as you care about the average. That's all you matter. It's all that matters to you. Okay, so well, we wish to automate the process of making variance reduction go parameters go faster. As I said, this takes a lot of human time. So normally what we would do is you have some experienced engineer would sit down in front of their computer. They would decide, okay, here's your problem description. I think these techniques are gonna work and based upon their many years of experience, they twiddle the knobs by trial and error until they find a good set of parameters. And hopefully in the long run, things will run faster. That worked very well back in the old days in the seventies, eighties when computers were very expensive. However, nowadays, computers are very cheap. Costs of labor are very high. Now, this slide's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a humor, but in terms of what, what does a graduate student at the University of Michigan cost? You know, this is the total cost, $90,000 a year. Students don't make 90 k a year. That's a small part of it because you've got to pay the tuition, the benefits, the, the stipend, and well, they charge tax because, well, electricity bills, staff need to get paid. So, you know, if you're a graduate student, Jokingly now, you, if I were to get CPU cluster hours, it's $130 per core per year. So one graduate student is just as productive as 690 CP to HPC computer cores running, running nonstop throughout the year. Of course not, but that just gives you kind of an idea of how much human time costs versus how much computer time costs. So if we can offload that computer, that labor onto the computer and make that also more efficient, we can reduce the expense, total amount of money or electricity bills necessary to run calculations. And this matters for very large problems where you might have to run your problem for, for days, weeks, even months potentially to get a statistically converged answer. Okay, so using deterministic methods to accelerate Monte Carlo methods are not like right The idea has been around for well, about as long as the current well, crisis, you know, the 60s really. And what I would say the current state of the state of art is a method called CADIS. This is an adjoint driven important sampling. And what this does is it uses a low fidelity deterministic solution to provide parameters that are called lower window, weight window bounds, which are just a, 
clever way of combining splitting and roulette together that we showed on the previous slide. And using that, we can push particles to important regions of the problem more efficiently. So KDIS is a wonderful method. It is, you can, in many problems, you can get a factor of 100 to 1,000, even more improvements in the performance of the calculation. But it doesn't work for every problem. It's not a, it's not a silver bullet. It's not a one size fits all. So a few of the limitations of KDIS are one, you really don't have much in the way of angular biases. In other words, there's a directional dependence to the particle radiation. Weight windows are not very effective as a technique, which is what KDIS uses, of steering particles throughout a problem, changing the direction. Also, what, what I'm going to show an example of is weight windows and using importance maps from KDIS can lead to what's called aggressive oversplitting. So a lot of wasted computational time. And I'll show a figure explaining this. And the other thing is it's really limited to a small number of tools in the toolbox. So as I said, there are many variance reduction techniques out there. This only works for a couple of them. So it's unclear how you apply this to other techniques that may have some angular bias in the information. Okay, so let's illustrate some of these issues. So what we have is a source detector shielding problem. You have a source in the lower left corner, a detector behind that's sitting behind an optically thick shield, and then a bunch of air. The way this problem is set up is the, is the path that particles want to take is to not go through the shield. They need to go above the air, scatter, so in other words, bounce off an air molecule, come down and somehow find the detector. That's the goal of this. So what we did is we ran advantage, which is the implementation of the Oberge tool using the KDIS method, and we generated some weight All right, so what I did here is I plotted what is a typical scoring history. So in other words, a particle that we're simulating in, 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 in our brain, in our mind problem random walk, what does it look like? Well, if we take a look at this, particle starts in the lower left corner, and if it happens to cross over above the shield, we'll notice that it starts multiplying like that. So you get a large number of these copies getting made as you get closer and closer to the detector. It's done in a very suboptimal way, it turns out. And if you're curious, this is what the importance or weight window map looks like. So, as well, inverse importance. So you'll notice you, you want to go from yellow areas to blue areas. So that's where you're kind of pushing the points. All right, so how I often look at this in terms of conceptualizing or one, one way of looking at this is plotting a histogram of how many tracks. And so a track here is particle going from one event to another event. How many of these are being done in a given history? And then say the frequency of that. So this is proportional to the amount of computational effort required to do, to do each, each individual random trial in the Monte Carlo simulation. And I kind of split it up here by particles that don't score and particle histories that do. Okay. Now, if you look at this, note the log, log scale on, the, on this. So you'll notice many histories, you'll have 10, 100, even up to a million trajectories that are going around on your computer every single history. Okay, so now what I can do is I can take the, the histories that gave scores, contribution to detector, and plot them versus their contribution to detector. So right here in the middle, this horizontal line, represents the mean value. That is the quantity we're trying to estimate. We're trying to understand the mean behavior of the radiation. The goal with variance reduction is we look at the scoring distribution. You want to smush this curve down to be as tight around the mean as you possibly can. That, that's what it means to reduce variance. So in other words, the less spread in, this, in, the, in the scores you're getting, the better. What you also want to do is you want to shift this lower distribution, the number of tracks for a given history, the amount of computational effort, you want to push this to the left as far as you can, because that means less work for this. So what a method like KDIS would do is it does a great job at doing the first, the, the thing on the left, smushing the distribution down. What it does not do a great job is, is it pushes this curve to the right. So in other words, histories are taking a very long time. The question is, can we do both simultaneously with a clever combination of techniques? Okay, 
So some of the challenges we encounter with variance direction, I said a little bit this, but I just want to make sure we kind of hammer this point home, is first of all, once you're given a problem, you got to decide what, what tools am I going to pull out of my toolbox? Which techniques are you going to use? This is very experiential. And we, we've actually re very recently applied some machine learning techniques using image classification. I'm going to mention briefly later. Brand new results for, for showing right now. Also, once you have the techniques, we then need to select the parameters of those techniques. How do we calculate those? So what we need to do is we really want to optimize what's called the figure of merit or minimize the inverse figure of merit, which is the cost. So it's proportional to the variance, which is R squared, and the computational time T. And I'll talk about how we can do this both simultaneously. And then once you ran these, and this kind of later on is, how do you know you're getting the right answer? So one of the problems with variance reduction is if you aggressively use variance reduction, if somebody is not careful, you can get misleading answers. So in other words, you can undersample parts of the problem and think your answer is something when it's really not. So I think there's still some open questions of how coming up with good, robust statistical tests to try to assess that this is the case. All right, so I've highlighted in bold the things I wanna to touch on. Okay, so the first one is how do we estimate computational time? Well, one way is you can run a bunch of histories and you can see how, how it's going to work. Well, I guess that works, obviously, and that's how you can benchmark it. But can you do this deterministically? And why you want to do this deterministically is because, well, this way I can generate an answer quickly and then optimize. So deterministic calculations fast, Monte Carlo slow. All right. So turns out there's an equation for this. Ah, there's equations for most things. And this is described by what we call the future time equation. I didn't come up with the name, but it's basically the equation that describes the expected computation, we can use to kind of the expected computational time of the history. There's some good news. It's the same structure as what we call our adjoint transport equation, which is the regular transport equations. Plan. So things that work for the regular equation, or numerical methods for the regular transport equation work for the backwards or adjoint transport equation. So the adjoint transport equation, so the forward equation tells where radiation is going. The adjoint equation tells how, how does radiation get to points of interest to us that I care about. So one moves radiation from source out into the problem. The, the adjoint equation says, I have a response, a detector. How do particles hypothetically get to my detector? Okay, so the difference is we include special source terms for the generation of computational time. So as we're running our simulation, if a particle, let's say, experiences a collision, across the surface, it takes the computer some amount of time, you know, some microsecond, 10 microseconds or something like that, to process that event. We include that as a source term in our equation. So what we do is we can use embedded timers using a very short Monte Carlo calculation to get a sense of what those source terms, the magnitudes of those source terms are. So how long does it take across the surface? How long does it take across the collision? Okay, so now we write down our good old future time equation. And if you've studied any transport, this looks, eh, I mean, kind of similar, except instead of a psi, you got the wonderful Greek letter capital epsilon. So you have the first three terms here. These are standard things you see in the transport equation streaming, total interactions, and scattering. The thing that's special is you have a collision source term. So it's proportional to the total cross section, which gives the collision rate times the time to transport plus the time to process a typical collision. And likewise, you have a boundary condition. So if you have particles flowing in, you have to account for the time to cross the surface, to reach the surface, and any contributions from outside. So if we chunk up the problem into various regions, we can write down an equation for a region, and we have boundary conditions associated with this. And then when we want to compute the expected time time, we solve this equation for epsilon. We add the time across the source, take the integral over the source distribution, and that gives us the time. And so what we do is we chunk up this problem and we use what's called a discrete ordinance or SN calculation you know, hammer software. All right. So we had a few test cases. The first is a very simple problem. It's a two, two by two mean pre-path, 2D problem. 
of the same material that we just chunked up with different radial zones. So we just basically made a bunch of annular regions. That is exactly the same material. Now, normally, what you would expect, you know, even if we put reflecting, if we put reflecting boundaries, it would be entirely the same. Put vacuum, you just kind of see like the coastline. We get for our results is you see these hot spots near the boundaries. Well, the reason for those hot spots is because particles near the surface is probably going to hit the surface, and that's going to take time, and that becomes a source. The way to interpret this heat map is if I plunk a particle down at this point right here, this color corresponds to the on average amount of time that particle is going to take in my simulation. So, so we benchmark this against Monte Carlo. The results agree. It's a pretty simple problem, but we're getting it within 20% of the rough solution. That's, not, that's a little bit higher than I would like personally, but it turns out that's probably for variance reduction. You don't need to get precisely the right answer. It's usually good enough to get close because how it kind of works is it kind of gets to a plateau. All right, so that was a little simple case. So we, did, we also did a shielding case. So you have optically thin air, you have a, a optically thick, strong absorbing shield in red, and the blue is a Nice concrete high scattering floor. So neutrons that go on the floor just bounce around a lot, eat up a lot of computational time. Here are results for a future time field. So what you'll notice here is if you if you plunk a neutron in the shield, it's a one and basically it's a one and none. Particle moves and it gets absorbed by the shield. It just gets eaten up. So it doesn't take very long. Particle, you plunk a particle down into the floor. Well, it's that's concrete. There's a lot of a lot of scattering going on. You just bounce around a long time and use up a lot of a lot of computing resources. So ideally, unless you actually care about the concrete, you don't want particles migrating into your concrete region and just bouncing around, eating up a lot of concrete time unnecessarily. So you want to mitigate that if you don't care about the flow path of particles in the concrete. A method like Cadis won't really account for that, for example. All right, so. I said there's two pieces to get the figure of merit, the thing we're trying to optimize, which is the variance times the time, one over the variance times the time. So we got the time. Can we get the variance? Well, it turns out we can. So there is an equation for this too, go figure, that, that is also an adjuvant like transport problem, but it's quite a bit more difficult. Okay, so how we do this is there are two equations we have to solve. So so work by Professor John Mattingly, he's done, he's worked with similar type of equations in structure, where you have work for the stochastic neutron transport equations, or moments of the stochastic neutron transport equations. So what we need to do is we need to first solve an equation for the mean. Okay, and that's the adjoint transport equation, the thing we all know and love and know how to solve. So once we have that, the result of the adjoint transport equation, the angular flux, serves as a source term in the equation for what's called the second moment, which is the ingredient for the variance. So if you remember the variance is the expectation of x squared in the second moment minus the expectation of x quantity squared, the first moment squared. Okay, so we need to get the first moment, square it, we get the second moment, and then take the difference of the two. Okay. So getting the second moment is a bit more difficult than getting the first moment. So what's different? Well, you use this again, you use the solution of the adjoint problem as a source term on this equation. Also, if we include variance reduction, there are additional terms that pop up into the equation. So, again, variance reduction, the whole point is to preserve the mean. So, it doesn't change the adjoint transport equation, everything just falls out. Where the second moment equation, you have these extra terms you have to account for. So, what we did is we developed a method. And we picked a particular variance reduction technique. And we worked on this with, with actually the source and application enabling technologies for source technologies. This is called forced flight or DX trans. So I'll explain a little bit about what that is and why we chose it. Okay, so forced flight is a wonderful variance reduction technique. It's very good in problems that have where directional dependence or angular biasing is important. So examples are if you need to model a research reactor beam port. You have a satellite, you want to do remote sensing to get particles to that satellite. And fusion reactors, they're often small penetration ducts where you put instrumentation in. Well, they become paths for radiation. If you want to quantify the dose and steer particles into that. 
So what force flight does is it takes particles from one part of the problem, and every time you have a source event or collision event, it pulls information like a magnet to parts of the problem that you decide are important. Now, in specific situations, it's a very powerful technique. You can get sometimes it's really the only option in your toolbox that will effectively give you an answer. The issue is it can be very finicky. It works well when it works well, and sometimes it's not obvious when it's going to work well. So automation here would actually be quite helpful if we could figure out a way to do this, because again, it's, it's kind of a hit or miss kind of technique and be helpful to be able to determine when will it be good, how will it be good, when will it not be good. Okay, so kind of said this, uh, so, but basically the idea is that every source of that collision that pulled particles over to a region of interest that you define, and what you do is you modify the, the statistical weight by some factor to preserve the, the probability of a particle transporting from the collision point over to this region of interest. Now, how you preserve the average value is done in a very not obvious, uh, non intuitive way. But if a particle happens to cross this region, it goes bye bye. And I'll explain that in just a sec. So let's do this with a little bit of a card here. So here's my source. Here's my detector. I'm going to wrap it in some force flight region of interest, denoted by this uh, dashed line. All right, so right at source event, we, what we do is we, ran, we, draw, we draw a cone out to the sphere. We randomly sample a point on the surface of the sphere. And then we cast a ray up to this point, and we create a particle right on the surface of the sphere with a reduced weight based on the probability of the particle transporting from here to here on its next free flight. Okay. All right, so, so this uh, force flight particle continues on its merry way, does whatever it does. The original particle moves on, has a collision. At a collision site, we say, okay, let's play the force flight game again. Draw a cone, randomly select a location on the sphere, find the exponential attenuation, give its weighting, and create a new particle that moves on its merry way. Now suppose this original particle moved in and tried to cross the sphere. What it does to preserve the balance of weight, it goes pro, it goes by by on the sphere. Okay, why is that? Well, the math says to do it, one. <laughs> Two, the way to conceptualize this is this part of the event space was handled by this probability sampling of the force flight sphere. So if you allow this original particle to enter the force flight region, what you're doing is you're double counting that part of the probability space. So you split the probability space into two classes of events, ones that enter the particle and ones that do not. And you force particles to do the ones that enter the particle. All right. So what we had to do this research is again, the, the second moment equation requires new terms. So we had to devise what that would look like. I don't want to belabor this one. It looks kind of ugly, but this is what it is for the production of particles. And we also had to modify the streaming term to truncate particles once they hit this sphere right here. All right, equations look ugly, let's draw, let's look at some pictures of what this looks like. So, so we have some point P where some either source or collision event occurs. And this area right here represents the, the, the truncated streaming term. So basically the event space for particles just streaming out spherically from this source. And then we have this piece right here for the production of those particles. So this represents particles that would have come and hit the sphere on the net here in this box on this next free flight. Okay, so what we did is we took equations and I'm not gonna show them to you because they're like page long kind of things. So we'll skip that. And we implemented this. So we're working with Los Alamos. They have a code there to solve these things. The deterministic SN code called Colbert. So it solves the first moment equations and the future time, here's the second moment equation, future time equations. So what we're doing. With the SN method. So the goal, eventually we want to migrate this to the hammer, but it's not a hammer. So we only have the computational time piece, not the second moment piece. So put the, we modified Cobert to include these, these extra terms for force flight. And what we did is we, the kind of the interesting doctoral dissertation part of the work that is developing those, those, those terms. It's for how to do the transport suites for the truncated kernels. So we had to develop a special transport suite to handle this in a semi-efficient sort of way and still get the right answer. 
All right, so I guess uh, I should probably show some results. It's an engineering talk after all. Um, so I guess things work. So we came up with a bunch of test cases. So here's no force flight with force flight and one here being good. So everything except for this one case right here is pretty good. I mean, we're seeing large screens, but this was an intentionally hard problem. So, and we know this is just basically from what's called numerical artifacts called gray effects, or at least we have strong evidence that it is. We just couldn't afford to climb things down effectively. Okay, well, so let's just take a little, little bit more look at some results. So what we did, is we did a what's called duct streaming problem. So we have a source of particles here on the bottom, and we want to get particles through this duct to the surface on the right. And what we did is we threw in this force flight region in the middle. So this kind of acts like a magnet to pull our particles to the middle of this. And this duct has a nice little 90% turn to make it interesting. So we ran this through, through covert and got our determinist SN calculation. So we calculated the first moment, which is the adjoint flux. We calculated the second moment, which used the adjoint flux as a source term. So the way to think about this plot is by if you plunge the particle down right here, this is, this is the expected contribution for this leakage tally right now. Second moment is if I point the particle right here, this is the expected contribution to the expectation of x squared. Okay. Here's the future time field. Compute that too. You'll notice it's pretty uniform across. It doesn't really change all that much. And then what, I, what we did is we plotted the cost or inverse figure merit, which is what we're trying ultimately trying to minimize. So we want to maximize the figure merit or minimize the cost. So kind of interesting features on here. It's very low cost over here because you're near the edge of the duct. Okay, that's cool. But you know, if you get into these fringes of the problem, you're just going to scatter around, bounce around, and not contribute to, to your talent, just waste a bunch of time. So, question is Did force flight help us? Well, the short answer is for our problem, yes. <coughs> Here's a useful way to kind of conceptualize that I find conceptualize this. This is the fractional change in the second model, which is proportional to the ground, which goes in between the bearings. So, you'll notice that force flight is technique. Decrease the variance everywhere. So, regardless of where you start the particle or wherever the particle is, it's going to have a lower contribution to the variance. All right. But you'll notice the overall cost did not get better for particles out here. And the reason is because they, you're pulling particles back against where you want them to be. Kind of obvious, but it's a test problem. We wanted to show it. So, yes, it helps for particles starting right here where they actually start. So, you get some improvement. But you'll notice out here, it's actually kind of worse. So it turns out this is not the best place to put this force flight region. We ran some optimization and lo and behold, you kind of want to enclose the tally, kind of makes sense. But again, yeah, we just wanted to show a test problem and prove our optimization worked. Okay, so kind of where we're going is we can get the computational cost or the inverse figure of merit and we can do this with determinist SN calculations. So some challenge we have is this is quite efficient for what are called weights independent things. So in other words, decisions you make don't depend on the statistical weight. But if you have that decision dependent on the statistical weight, the cost goes way up because you have to augment your phase space with this statistical weight variable. That's an open question of how to, uh, that needs to get addressed for things to be practical. So we've successfully applied optimization to minimize the competition cost but it's a little bit too slow right now. So we'd like to look at using things like perturbation estimators. So some of the work Professor Mattingly did, I think will be hopefully useful for this. And also we'd like to give a heuristic, it would be nice to come up with some, some heuristic like Cadis or FW Cadis that they can use to rapidly generate maps as well to improve variance reduction parameters. I don't know if that's possible. It's things we can play around, that we're gonna play around with in the coming years. Okay, so I mentioned selecting the variance reduction technique. So which one you pick depends on the problem. So materials, geometry, the source term, responsive interest. So normally this is done based on experience. Question is, can we automate this? So we have some, so we have some new results that I'm gonna show and just thinking of what are the things we need to estimate this and what's our hypothesis? So we need information about, well, where is the radiation going from its source? This is described by the radiation field. The adjoint function describes hypothetically how does radiation get to the detector. Okay, you take the product of the two, 
you get what's called the contributon, which is a map of flow of radiation from source to region of interest. So they kind of look like magnetic field lines if you were to plot this, going from source to detector. So the hypothesis is this contributon field encodes information about the preferred paths that radiation wants to travel to go from the source to the detector. And we can use that to classify our problem type and identify techniques. So what we did is we were using, we're just starting to use some machine learning techniques based on image recognition. So things like that identify characters that you would, that you would encounter for say, is this the letter A? So what we've done is we constructed a large set of training data containing our two dimensional contributon fields where we know what the suitable techniques would be. We train a neural network on this. Then we take problem of interest, we compute its contributon field, feed it in, and say, can you appropriately identify the, the pertinent features? And then once we identify the techniques that are relevant, we then include this in our cost optimization method, just those techniques. Because if you had to explore the whole space, it would just be too hard. All right, so we have some results that we got in the last few weeks. So as we started 3,000 test problems, they're split it up by different problem types. We have deep penetration shielding problems, sky shining problems, duct shielding problems. And we use TensorFlow neural networks that we trained on 2850 of these using low resolution contributon fields. And well, the good news is we were able to identify the remaining 150 cases that we randomly did not use as part of the transfer. Well, that doesn't tell us whether we've had solved the problem or not. That's coming in the, in the months and years ahead. But at least it shows that the technique is at least semi-plausible. So that's kind of just hot off the press results I just wanted to share with you guys. So and where do we need to go? Well, we need to expand, refine our database. Well, we just did some very simple 2D problems. So we need to expand this to a 3D multi-group, include much more cases. Some of the challenges is a lot of the image classification work is kind of restricted to two dimensions because while well, you're reading a character on a 2D sheet of paper, how is this going to scale with multiple dimensions is an open question. How do we handle scaling, translation, rotations? So, you know, if you rotate your problem 90 degrees, it's the same problem. And a lot of image recognition software doesn't understand that. There are techniques, but they work in 2D, but not clear about three and higher dimensions. So, currently, we're also kind of manually tagged all the problems. It would be nice to have a automated way to do if we're going to generate hundreds of thousands of these automatically to go into our database. And then we'd like to integrate this into our various production pipeline. Okay, so I know I'm running up against the clock, so but I do want to talk a little bit of some exciting work we're, we've done with Oak Ridge on generating Monte Carlo reactor transits. Okay, so when you're designing a nuclear reactor, you need to be able to understand, okay, what happens if there's an unintended reactivity insertion? So in other words, you go super critical, power goes up, and you hope the power comes back down before you damage the fuel and fire. Okay. I need to convince the regular that yes, indeed, my reactor is safe under plausible reactivity incursions like this, excursions. All right. So we're going to model time scales in the interest of my, in, on the scale of microseconds, so neutron behavior, up to tens or hundreds of seconds, which is delayed neutron, precursor emission. So this is an old field, various mathematical techniques can develop very low order dumb ones and increasingly sophisticated ones over the years. So very, I would say recently within the last 10 years, Monte Carlo methods have finally become, computers have finally gotten fast enough to permit Monte Carlo methods to become plausible for using simulating reactor transits. Okay, so how could one do this? Oh. There's a, there's a simple naive approach. Actually, this was suggested by John von Neumann in his first letter in, on how to do Monte Carlo. Still enough. You have your problem, you have a time scale, you chunk up the time domain, you hold the properties constant over time domain, you simulate the particles, you find out how much energy is deposited, how many delayed neutrons are created, and you update things for the next time step and move along. Explicit time stepping for a roiler, it's easy to code. But if you tried to do this in practice, it would be horrendously slow. It would be what's called a hero calculation. So nobody would use something like this for practical design. Okay. So uh, what can we do? We're going to use Monte Carlo. Well, you can use lower determinants methods to accelerate this turns out. Okay, so first thing is we have to understand a little bit about the physics. So whenever you're solving a problem, you know, good to kind of understand what are the mathematical properties that are relevant. So 
what's done in a lot of transient analysis is we apply quasi-static approximations. So what we can do is we can introduce a factorization. So the angular flux, the distribution of neutrons, can be described as the product of two functions. One is an amplitude function that is only dependent on time that varies rapidly. The other is a shape function describing the distribution of neutrons that varies slowly with time. So you have two different functions that evolve in time on, on very different time scales, and you can solve those on different time scales. So what we can do is you can use exact like kinetics models to solve for the amplitude function, and you can use transport diffusion, some higher order solver to solve for your, your, your space one. Okay, so we take our lovely neutron transport equation, we apply a backwards Euler discretization. Okay, I'm not going to belabor this. Left hand side, we have our loss terms, neutrons migrating around, then they and they can also get go bye bye from reaching the end of the time step. You get re emissions gains of the previous time step, you get prompt vision sources, and we got to handle the delayed neutron special because of our discretization scheme. You have different source terms popping out with different statistical weightings, whether they decayed in this time step, they accumulated over very previous time steps, etc. So how we handle this in Monte Carlo is each of these terms on the right-hand side gets its own special little source bank or tag within source banks to handle these special source terms that pop out in our kinetics calculation. So we do is we, we treat the problem as a k-eigenvalue, stat, static criticality problem with these special source terms. Okay. So it turns out if you take if you take Monte Carlo, you communicate directly with Zach on kinetics equations. One, it's slow. Two, you get a lot of statistical noise. Okay, so what's done is we you insert a middle layer. So the one that seems to work quite well is called coarse mesh finite difference. And it's kind of a diffusion-like scheme. So what you do is we have a high fidelity solution on a, on a long time scale for transport. We have the middle level where we do this coarse mesh finite difference solution. So the difference here is transport gives us directional dependence and high fidelity space energy dependence. This gives us a coarse spatial space energy resolution, but evolves on a quicker time scale. And we have the amplitude function that evolves on a fast time scale. All right, so we have results. So this is uh, some work actually done in this department to develop this benchmark. The C5 G7 time dependent three numerical benchmark results, and we compare it against a deterministic solver called impact, which has been benchmarked. So there are some various transients done for basically what we do is we change the moderator density artificially in the problem. And this leads to a change in the reactivity that we want to calculate. All right. So what we did is we ran our problems. So first we did what's called, we, we implemented this in the shift Monte Carlo code for Mobridge. So they've been very generous one of us. And we ran four different cases of this TD benchmark that I showed in the previous slide. So we have the shift predictor corrector quasi-static method, which is just taken Monte Carlo directed to exact point kinetics. We did this multi-level scheme that inserts a CMFD layer, and then we compare it against impact. All right, so what we notice from our results compared to benchmark so reference solutions is adding this middle layer improves the accuracy. Also significantly improves the computational time relative to our deterministic reference solution. Okay, so still a lot more expensive than deterministic, but it's getting more plausible to actually do transient calculation with my car using such a scheme. Okay, so this is looking great, but I hate to say this work is not necessarily super original. Other people have done this too. And I have a student who wants to get his dissertation, so he needs to do some original research. So what he's look, gonna look at is something really exciting called parallel and time integration. So normally when we parallelize Monte Carlo calculations, we have a couple ways of doing it. First way is you, the most common way is you parallelize on histories. So you take all the particle histories and you run them on separate either processes across a distributed network or on the individual cores in your computer, share the distributed network. And that works very well. You can also chunk up the spatial domain into various regions and do what's called domain decomposition. This is actually very commonly used in deterministic methods. It works reasonably okay in Monte Carlo, but there are some issues. 
question is, can we do parallelization in time? Well, it turns out there are approaches to do this, but it's still an open question that we hope to address is can we get improved performance doing it this way? All right, so there are various methods for parallel and time integration. The most common one is called the parallel method. So that's the one we're starting with. So you have two solvers. One is a low cost method, which is done in a fine time scale that's computed in parallel. And G is a high cost method done on a coarse time scale computed in silver. So what we do is we have this time stepping or time integration algorithm it can be written as follows. So we have we introduce this iteration index K and we have this time step index M. So we have so if we just want to do explicit time stepping, Y would equal to F times the previous solution times with a delta T factor. That would move us forward in an explicit way. All right. We could also introduce these two G terms. And what you'll notice here is these G, these high cost coarse time scale methods, is there's an iteration K plus one K. And the hope is, if it converges, that these two G terms cancel out, giving us back the original answer we get if we just brute force this. All right. So the question is can we do this more efficiently? All right, so again, very early results here, so nothing super fancy, but we just wanted to see, can we solve the exact point kinetics equations with using backward order and will it parallel in time even be feasible? So this is just like, will it work at all? So what we did is we got a prescribed reactivity for those auto parts, so a solver that's used by, used in industry to do reactor transients. And we do is we show the viability for various reactor trends, pairing with analytics or analytic solutions or results from parks. And I say these results are parallel in time. Well, it's because it's you know, we ran it serially, but we did it in a way that it, it would effectively be parallel in time. So we don't have any performance measures for you right now. We just we need to actually do the parallel implementation. But the methodological conclusions of feasibility still hold up here. All right, so we ran a couple of tests. One is a ramp insertion. We have an analytic solution. So we have a coarse and fine time scale. And the point I want to highlight is what you have here is your original coarse discretization. And we're trying to converge this gray line right here, our ramp solution. And it turns out that we're able to converge within three to four iterations. So we get fairly rapid convergence. That's good. All right, so well, that's kind of an artificial test problem one uses. What about something that's like a control rod ejection? So we can actually see in a practical scenario. Well, we have to obviously use shorter time scales because it's, prop, it's driven by prop vision now. So you have five millisecond time, of uh, course, time grids, uh, quarter of a millisecond fine time grids. And we see is very similar behavior. So we actually shoots up, goes power shoots up, goes down, and very quickly within a couple iterations it converges. So again, very early results. It says, this is not a dumb idea, basically. It's what we've, we've established. It can work for reactor transient simulation. The open question is, can we apply all those high fidelity transport informations? Can we use Monte Carlo and CNFD as our course fine time? So how, how can we fit these things together in a manner to get improved performance and more parallel time integration methods? So, that's what we have coming up with, uh, with Evan in his uh, six to 12 months ahead. So I look forward to hopefully be able to tell you guys at some point about great results, but we'll find out. It's research. All right. Well, I just want to acknowledge funding sources. We've gotten funding from DOE, and then 22 has been very generous. The National Laboratories have helped us out quite a bit with staff time. And former students who are not part of the team also helped generate these results that have moved on to bigger and better things. Okay. Well, that's uh thanks so much for uh taking the time to listen to me. Sam, do you have any questions? So if you don't mind, Brian, yeah. uh, would you repeat the question for the benefit of, the of course and also the recording? Yes. Uh, I guess is there a zoom? Oh, I'll take care of that. Okay. Yeah, just in the room. All know. right, cool. All right, any questions in the room? Yeah, the user. Yeah. You can show uh, slide 19. Slide 19. Maybe. 
if it lets me. <laughs> All right, slide. I always worry about when you do um, biasing with deterministic. You can see uh, to the right and the green, mm -hmm. there are great effects here. No, oh, I'm yes, yes. How does this influence the accuracy of? All right, so the question is, how do numerical artifacts, spray effects introduce the accuracy of the bias solution? That's a wonderful question because I don't know if there's ever, there's truly a one size fits all answer to it, to be honest. So it depends on the problem type. Now, the good news about variance reduction is it's kind of a plateau. If you get close to the optimal behavior, you kind of, you, you, you know, it's like big these gains are good enough, but again, it kind of depends on how bad are the ray effects in a given problem. How much does it impact the solution? So it's it's an I think that's a good it's a good question research question to address actually. But are you saying that it only changes the optimality but not the actual mean and variance component? Well, what it will do, well, it, it it does not change the mean. So the mean does not change in any variance reduction. The variance will be impacted, and I guess you could get lucky; it could get better from the ray effects, you know. <laughs> but more likely than not, it'll make it worse. Other questions? I see one in the chat. No, that's me. Okay. Reminding people they can post questions to the chat. All right. <laughs> cool. Check participants too. <laughs> okay, I have one. Sure. So when we're doing um, source biasing or the weight cutoff, mm -hmm. that's how basically you count for what we're forcing the system. So I don't think I understand for the first flight, how do you account for like what you the bias you introduced when it goes back to statistics? Okay, so yeah, I can the best I can do is the hand wave with this for you without getting deep into mathematics. No, no, I don't it doesn't have to be deep. I just like I, yeah. I just want so, to be so the way. idea is you're producing additional particles here, additional weight. And this is from the probability event space dealing with particles that would have hit, that would hit the sphere. Okay? So you have probability of events that go into the sphere, and you have probability events that don't. So you're producing additional weight, additional information on the surface of the sphere. So to preserve the probabilities and expectations, what you need to do is if a part, if your regular particle outside of this region tries to enter, it has to be terminated because this was handled in a different part of the probability space. And it's a hand way of explanation for you, I know, but it's kind of like, it's one of the most obscure, difficult techniques to understand. And honestly, we couldn't even find a derivation proving that this was correct in any of the literature we did. So we had to re-derive all this. We went back to Los Alamos records as far as we did in the 70s when this was first developed, and we found nothing on this. So it's always been, it works, we promise. Where's the math? Well, we just proved it as we expect. Thank you. Yes, great question. Other things? Yes. Yeah, so y'all, uh, you mentioned that uh, you mostly use variance reduction methods were done in space, spatial mm -hmm. dimensions. You mentioned it could be done in angular mm -hmm. and with some authors who've done that. Um, what about energy or time dependent? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. So what about energy and time dependence? Yes, so that's actually done too. I didn't bring it up, but you can have your biasing parameters be functions of energy and time as well. In fact, MCMP lets you do that. So it's actually very common. I just didn't bring it up in this talk. Other questions? Ask you sure. So when you did the um the fine dependence with the three fine scales, right? Yeah. I mean, does this does this take into account uh, feedback? So it, that's a great question. Does this take into account feedback? In in principle, yes, it will. So the results we showed. We, what we did is we artificially included the, the change in reactivity. We didn't include like the Doppler broadening. That's one of our next tasks we're going to do in shift is use the Doppler broadening. So it's, it's on our near-term agenda. 
and, and then how would you do it on these three schedules? So the transport is going to be much, much bigger time stretch. Yeah, so our hope yeah, is that one, we can get CMFD coefficients accounting for feedback. And we, we're thinking of maybe using perturbation theory for this, as well as calculating like a Doppler coefficient that we could plug into the Plectinetics equation. So putting in a feedback model for that. Yeah, that's a very good point you bring up about feedback is, yeah, we haven't quite gotten there yet. Let's hope it's on our next steps. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned uh, parallelization and time, right? Yeah. So in transient calculations, I know you have to, to like invoke some sort of population control at each step. Yes. And uh, you have to store or save the neutron uh, uh, distribution, mm -hmm. or at least uh, some of it, for the next step. Mm -hmm. So how does like how would you do that with the parallelization and time? All right, that is an excellent question. So what is done, and, and I didn't go into all the details of this, is we're running a static data model like this from Bank and Plains of the Source Max. And what we do is every time we apply what's called a particle call. So what we do is we change the weights, statistical weights on everything, but we keep the population of singularity particles under control. Okay, so some similar scheme would have to be done that accounts for the increase in the amplitude function for low, low order solves. That, and so we preserve the, part, the simulated particle population, the actual population is handled in these statistical weights, and the balances are done with these weighting correction factors. Other things people might be curious about. Yeah. Have you tried different methods in CMFD um, for that intermediate solve? So the quick question is, have we tried different methods for CMFD? We have not. We've actually talked about doing this. So one of the things we, I don't know if we'll get to this with, with Evan, but as we talked about using like SP, simplified P3 method, which is actually available in SHIFT right now. So that's something we've discussed is can we use a different low order transport method? We just did CMFD because other groups are doing it and it shows well for reactor type problems. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great question. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. So why don't we thank Brian one more time? All right. thank, thank you. Everybody.